first segment is going to be the, the virtual grocery store tour. And like I said, you have a packet on this. And so this packet is going to give you a lot more information than I can present in the, in the 90 minutes for this lecture. So there's going to be a lot of information though still. So first thing off, we're going to get started with the outline. So we're going to discover the five ingredients to avoid. And again, this is right in your packet, and this is what you want to absolutely stay away from when you shop for food products or any kind of food in general. Second, we're going to go through the organic versus non-organic debate. Uh, and then as an extension, we're going to go through local versus non-local. And then we're going to go and do the, the butter versus margarine, because that's also a widely, uh, widely talked about topic. Uh, best kind of ice cream to eat, so I think this is going to be a favorite with everybody here. The best kind of ice cream. And then, we're, and much more. So we're going to go through much more as well. Uh, so first, just show of hands, who shops for food? All right, oh, there we go. So please listen up, because we're going to go through a lot of information, this, and this is going to be directly applicable to, to you and what you can see in the grocery store tour, or in the grocery store. So we're going to start with the produce section. Typically, when you go into a supermarket, it's going to be right into the produce. You're going to see tons of colors. You're going to see nice, lots of bright signs. It's going to look probably like this. And so, I mean, there's lots of stuff there. Lots of signs, go organic, all that. So the first thing when we think about produce is salads. I mean, I ask everyone all the time, you know, how's your eating? And then the first, I mean, 90% of the time I'll hear, oh, it's great, I eat a lot of salads. So everyone has, a, the, I guess, the assumption that healthy eating is salads. So with that, the dressings, it can really actually break a salad or it can make your salad in terms of, I mean, you, you don't even have to have a dressing except, you know, the, the dressing is really what we want to watch out for uh, with the ingredients and the nutrition. 95% of the dressings on store shelves are, are, are pretty much junk. You know, they're not really, they're just filled with just terrible ingredients. And we're going to go through some of those so you get an idea of what exactly I'm talking about. And again, it's part of those five ingredients to avoid. So there's tons of options, there's tons of dressings, and I'm gonna show you some alternatives to the dressings that you can have instead of buying those. And then, just to get into it, the two ingredients that we're gonna avoid are high fructose corn syrup and soybean oil. Okay, I'll explain why. So this is the first thing. We have the ranch dressing on, this, on, on here. I mean, that's typically what it looks like. You just have a ton of variety, a ton of options. And also the interesting thing is that this one says fat-free and this one says light. So it's pretty interesting because initially we're, we're thinking, oh, healthy, light, fat-free, it's good to go. Now, if you look on the back, you're going to see the ingredients list and you're going to see a lot of ingredients that you may not recognize. So the first thing is water, the second thing is corn syrup, the third thing is maltodextrin. That's in your, that's in your buttermilk ranch. And then we have modified food starch, and then buttermilk is the fifth ingredient. Of all those things, I mean, what's recognizable to you? Just anybody? Water and buttermilk, probably. The other two, uh, maltodextrin sugar, modified food starch. I mean, that's not necessarily something that's going to make a salad healthy. So we keep on going down, and you're going to see a couple other things, soybean oil being another one of them, and just a whole ton of preser preservatives and those kind of things. Uh, why do we want to stay away from soybean oil? The, the truth of the matter is that it's a very, very cheap type of oil. It's very, very cheap, highly processed. Uh, little to no nutrition within soybean oil, and that's why it's in almost everything. That's why I said 90% of dressings are junk. It's because it's in 90% of dressings. Uh, these big uh, food manufacturers are just cutting costs, like Hidden Valley and Kraft. I mean, those are the two biggest ones. They're just cutting costs, and of course, they're going to put the soybean oil right in there because most people just don't know the difference. Uh, the other thing that they use soybean oil for is because it's tasteless. It's tasteless, so it doesn't have, uh, so they can put the other ingredients in there, so it won't mask the other ingredients, uh, the other flavors. So this is actually, this is taken from, I believe, the fat-free ranch. And so we look at the fat-free, and of course, yeah, there's no fat, except there's a ton of other junk in it. And I'm not sure how, or, you know, there is going to be a little fat because of the soybean oil as well. Of course, they just don't mark it because if it stays within under, under 0.49 grams per serving, they can say zero. So they round down. So you are still getting some fat in there. Uh, 
So that's a little bit misleading as well. We're going to go to the next example so you get the idea of what's going on. So again, we saw the front of that. It said fat free. It said light for the ranch. And now we see this one. It says extra virgin olive oil on the front of this. This is actually Greek vinaigrette. And then it says extra virgin olive oil. And then I want to look at the back again because to be honest, the front doesn't matter. The front is more marketing. The front just wants to tailor you in, pull you right in to get you to buy their product. The back is really the key. That's what's going to tell us everything. So we turn around, we see water, we see extra virgin olive oil, which is good. And we see soybean oil, which is bad. And so you keep going on and then you see just a couple extra things. This one's not too bad. A lot better than the first one because it has the extra virgin olive oil and it has some ingredients that I recognize such as garlic, feta cheese, vinegar, salt, red wine vinegar, those kind of things. Now to tell you a little bit more about how to read an ingredients list, the very first ingredient is always going to be the most prevalent, the, the heaviest. So they go by weight and then they put the first ingredient there uh, by the heaviest and then it goes on from there. Again, I, I, I would suggest just stay away from this type of oil just because of the soybean oil. Uh, you know that there's quite a bit in there just because it's right next to the extra virgin olive oil. It's right, next to the, it's right at the top. And even though it says made with extra virgin olive oil, it's not 100%. It's not 100% true. So my suggestion is, and again, I've looked through a lot of different dressings in terms of what could be best. And the best one that I've seen is called this Galeo's Cafe. They make a miso style dressing. I'll get into miso a little bit later, except miso in itself is very, very healthy. It's fermented, fermented soybean paste, so you see it right there. Now, it's a little bit different than soybean oil. It's actually much, much different, which is why I would recommend that. Uh, the second thing is that you have fresh garlic, lemon juice, red, red vinegar, capers, anchovies, mustard. I mean, those are an extra virgin olive oil. And then sea salt, anchovies. I mean, those are all natural foods. You would recognize them in nature. That's what I mean. Those are all natural foods. So this is the best dressing that I've found. They have a couple different flavors. And, uh, and I've seen it at Safeway, Time Supermarket, those kind of things. Uh, it's one of the few that has quality ingredients that you would, you'd be able to recognize. So this is what I would advocate for. The second thing I would advocate for is just making your own. Making your own. And it's very simple. You just combine an acid and a base. Just an acid and a base to your dressing. Uh, acids could be anything from citrus, any kind of citrus fruits or juices. Uh, acids could be uh, vinegars. There's tons of vinegars out there. Vinegars are very, very cheap often. I mean, white vinegar, red wine vinegar, balsamic is great, apple cider is great. I mean, you could really mix up a ton of your own different dressings. And then you have your acid and then your, and then your base being your oil. Extra virgin olive oil is one of the top. Extra virgin just stands for it's the least processed. So there's going to be multiple uh, oils that you'll see, and we'll get into this a little bit later, except extra virgin is, what the, is the one I would stick to. It's the least processed. It's the one that has the most nutrients. It's the most beneficial for you. Uh, so yeah, like I said, you can either make your own or just buy the Galeo's miso dressing, those two suggestions. I haven't found actually any other type of dressing that really would fit the bill. There's some, again, that come close, like that Greek vinaigrette made with extra virgin olive. That comes close. That's not quite there. So this is all about what's optimal, what's best. Of course, you know, there's going to be some that are in the middle. There's going to be some that are down below. We want to stay from the down below at all costs, you know, and then you could choose whether you'd want the, the best or, you know, in the middle. Uh, the very exciting thing for you all today, too, is that Mr. Shimona is going to be going through how to make a, a good and very, very tasty dressing. So he's going to be going into that a little bit later into in the first breakout session. So get ready for that. So we're going to move on to oils. So extra virgin olive oil, like I said, is the top. And then you see this extra light over here. Now the difference between the two is actually the color. And it's not the bottle. The bottle is the same, the same color. I, I made sure to... Uh, I made sure that I wasn't going to grab a, a black bottle and claim that as, as dark oil. The color actually depends on how processed it is. So the lighter oil is, you know, it's heated a lot more. So it takes the flavoring out. And unfortunately, it does take a lot of the nutrients out. So that's why I wouldn't advocate for just regular olive oil or extra light or whatever the, whatever the lighter color olive oils are. Extra virgin is the way to go. 
Uh, and that goes for coconut oil as well. So I gave you my list of top three there. You have extra virgin olive oil, extra virgin coconut oil, and then macadamia nut oil. Those are all very highly nutritious uh, and the least tampered with, the least heated. Uh, some of the f uh, worst oils that you, can, that you can buy are soybean oil. And soybean oil is synonymous with vegetable oil. So it's the same thing. Uh, actually, food manufacturers, just to be a little tricky, to make it sound healthy, they call soybean oil vegetable oil in some labels. So just be aware of that. Same thing, though. Second thing is canola oil. Canola oil, otherwise known as rapeseed, uh, it's basically, again, just, like, just the same with soy. It's highly, highly pro uh, processed in terms of the oil itself. Very, very cheap. Uh, the government does subsidize it, so I mean we have large, large quantities of it. And the other thing to watch out for, it's genetically modified. Uh, and that's a whole other topic for another, for another day. Uh, we do want to stay away from most genetically modified foods. There's a big discussion about that now, especially uh, at, the state, at the state capitol. So, I mean, again, that's just a little bit beyond the extension of this topic, except, you know, if you have questions, I could... I'd be more than happy to answer that for you. So soybean, canola, corn, corn and another highly subsidized uh, food product in the United States. And uh, it's very, very abundant, it's very, very cheap. And of course, they make corn oil and the high fructose corn syrup is another offshoot of that. And then sunflower oil. And again, that's just uh, high, high in uh, omega-6s and we're gonna stay away from omega-6s and I'll explain that towards the end of the, towards the, end of the lecture. Now, we're going to go through the, the organic versus non-organic, the local versus non-local debate. So the environmental working group ended up doing this, this long, long study. And they're just a third party agency, no affiliation, anything. They did a long, long study. Basically, what they did was they came up with the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 based off their studies on all this produce, all this produce with pesticides and herbicides. So they took all this conventionally raised produce, they washed it, they cleaned it, they did everything they could, and then they tested it for how much, pro, uh, how much pesticide and herbicide was within the actual fruit or vegetable. So the dirty dozen is the, the most contaminated uh, conventionally raised. So my suggestion is when you go to the store and you have the list on page three, you can check out the whole list there. I just put the, the top three examples or some of the top examples. When you go to the grocery store, keep this list handy. And my suggestion is for the dirty dozen side, make sure you get organic. Get organic because you don't want to have the pesticide and herbicide within your body, especially long term if you continually put that stuff in. Uh, and then the clean 15, such as onion, sweet corn, pineapple, typically that's been the least contaminated. So that stuff, it really doesn't matter if you want to, I mean, you can still go organic if you want to. It doesn't matter if you don't. Uh, I mean, it's all up, it's all up to you and your, and your, and your budget because that's typically the the, the barrier be between most people is that most people see the, the higher price and they just stick towards the conventionally raised since it's often cheaper. So go organic when you see the dirty dozen and a couple ways to mitigate that cost is basically just going to Costco. I mean that's what I do. I end up going to Costco, I buy big big bags of organic stuff, organic frozen vegetables and then I'm set to go. Or, uh, vegetables and fruits. It's often, I mean Half, half the price, at least, of the fresh stuff. The frozen foods also, they're, it's tough to say, except I would say they're on par nutritionally with fresh, with fresh produce, simply because they grow it, it's ripe, then they pick it, and then they flash freeze, it, and then it's often shipped. So sometimes you want to stay away from some, some of the fresh produce that's shipped from other countries, or even the mainland, simply because it's often grown Picked prematurely, synthetically, goes through a ripen cycle with, uh, you know, just some spray or whatever over the plane, and then it arrives fresh. I mean, it gives you the illusion of fresh when you get here. So it didn't really go through its whole maturation cycle and get all the nutrients that it really needed. So uh, that's the debate with local versus not uh, versus non-local. At all times, I would stick towards local when you can. Uh, and there's a lot more benefits than just nutrition. There's actually a whole host of benefits just in terms of the local economy and benefiting the farmers. And again, that's a whole other extension off of this lecture too. So if you have questions about that, uh, you know, please let me know. There's a whole host of local farms though on this island, which is great. And they all 
have some kind of community supported agriculture program, a CSA program. The cool thing about that is that you can get a fresh box of, of big local produce, uh, deli either delivered to your door or you can go pick it up on a weekly basis. And it's just based off of what is, what's in season. So you know you're getting something fresh, you know you're getting something that, that's supporting the local farmers, the local economy, and you know that it hasn't been you know, synthetically raised uh, over a plane you know, throughout a 15-hour trip or something like that. So my suggestion, again, is go local. I do have a list of resources uh, regarding the, some of the ones that I've used and some other ones that I haven't used that you could feel free to check out as well. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the website. It's transformationsfitness.net backslash seminar. Uh, the, the stuff isn't uploaded just yet, except everything I'm talking about, such as that list, uh, another, another copy of this packet, a PDF copy, so you have that electronically, that'll all be there. So you all get that email later on, and that way you can always check it out in case you lose this copy or, or so on. And then there'll be much more. Now the other thing is, you know, this is, this is your, your tour too, so I want you to ask questions based off of anything that we've gone through. Uh, so that being said, I'll just take a, take a second. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. So that's a great question. I mean, the question was, would you substitute other oils in recipes for all extra virgin olive oil? It depends on the recipe. So for something sweet, uh, for something sweet, I would substitute the extra virgin coconut oil because it's going to have a little more of a coconut taste than the olive taste. Uh, and then again, if you're if you're doing just some uh, just some just some baking dish or chicken or something like that, the extra virgin olive oil works great. Uh, the one thing with that is that the extra virgin olive oil does have a high it doesn't have a high heat tolerance. So I would not saute at high heats with the extra virgin olive oil because you're actually going to end up burning a lot of the nutrients uh, within the extra virgin olive oil, and uh, it's going to go rancid a little bit. So stick to uh, coconut oil if you're going to saute because it has a great high, high heat tolerance. And the other option is macadamia oil. And that, again, has a very high heat tolerance. So that's a great stir fry oil. Uh, and then I'm going to go through this a little bit later, except I won't give it away. I'll let you know what the other alternative is, too. So that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, either one of the two or the other option too is if you're just kind of, if you want to cut back on calories a little bit, unsweetened applesauce works great. It works great. I've used that uh, on occasion in terms of just substituting and it still has that great texture, great consistency. Yeah, I mean, you could even do a, a little bit of both if you want a little bit of the healthy fats from the macadamia oil, the coconut oil, and then the, healthy, uh, the unsweetened applesauce for, for texture too. Not that I know of. I mean, I believe they may have their own sources in terms of where they get it. Costco may get the, their organic primarily from, you know, the mainland or different countries. I mean, I'm not exactly sure where they get it. I just, if, I mean, it'll be indicated if it's local. Because some, some foods at Costco will say, you know, hydroponic uh, lettuce from Manoa. So you'll see that, and that's pretty cool. Uh, hydroponic organic lettuce. Uh, Down to Earth, I'm sure, has a bigger selection. Uh, for local organic stuff and so I mean the optimal best way to go is local organic for sure so any other questions so regarding the dirty dozen like celery for example does soaking it for a long time take off the pesticide or I don't think so because they I mean the environmental working group went through all sorts of different protocols and everything and it's just I mean it's just soaked right within, yeah, it's within, the, it's within the actual vegetable, the fruit itself. So, especially berries. Berries have such a thin skin that it just goes right in. And so, I was, I just kind of had an idea. I mean, you know, when we're talking about, like, what oils are good or what frozen vegetables from Costco are good, it would be cool to have, like, a list of things that you buy, like, specifically, maybe even, like, things to recommend 
like for example, buying some. What is your favorite thing from Costco? Buy frozen vegetables. For me? Yeah. I like the organic asparagus. Yeah. So just knowing that would be awesome, so that we could maybe buy that and try that out. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you have a general grocery list just right on the first page? Yeah, so it's not specific. So yeah, more specific towards like where the stores are yeah, and that kind of thing. Where the stores are, things that are, what you think are good. Like the miso dressing was awesome that I learned about. Okay. Other, other examples of things that you really mm -hmm. like that you think is a really good product would be great to share. Okay. Yeah. That's a good idea. So make it a little more specific towards this location? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Besides, besides Costco for organic bulk quantity, do you go to local, what local um, organic farm places, farmers markets do you shop at? So, the, the thing with that is that I've, I've, you know, went through quite a few different programs. One that we really like is called the Hawaiian Chef. Uh, the Hawaiian Chef, and they, the cool thing about them is they've had a lot of Groupons. And so you could get their boxes for $25, and it's a lot, a lot of produce. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Uh, tons, of, tons of options, and again, you get what's in season. So Hawaiian Chef is, is the one I would recommend, uh, based off of the other stuff that I've, that I've tested as well. And like I said, you're going to get the, the list of some other things, and you could always test it out and let me know how that goes. Because, you know, if, if you want to test out something and you want to test out something, I could take your feedback and then kind of put it into this, this little spreadsheet so it'll benefit others. So, yeah, Thank you. no problem. So at, at the farmer's market, are all their uh, produce organic or do they not use pesticides? No, oh, so let me, let, me, let me get into a little bit more detail. So organic is, is, I guess, technically the best, except a lot of the local farms aren't organic certified because the organic uh, requirements are very, very stringent. And I learned a lot more about this actually when I went to a, a local farm to, to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And they said that some, some of the, the rules are a little bit too stringent in terms of it's not necessary and it wouldn't benefit the, the food a little bit more. The other thing with the organic seal is that it takes some money. So it's another way for the FDA to, to get a little money from the farms. So a lot of local farms stay away from doing that, except they do technically raise it organically. So that's another interesting point, and you know that's something that that's, that should be mentioned. So with the local the local stands, typically again they're not going to use a lot of the herbicide pesticide. You could always ask though. Uh, they just want to save save some money and just you know <laughs> save some money and retain some profit there, so they don't get the organic seal. Okay. So, so I was. Typically, they don't use pesticides. Is that what you're saying? A lot that I've talked with haven't. So, and again, you know, I mean, you could always find out very specifically if they do or not. So, yeah, that organic thing is, a, is another thing. I mean, <laughs> we could talk about this kind of stuff all day, all day. So I'm going to continue on. And then again, if you have a question, just kind of pop in. Let me know. So the next thing is the soy controversy. Now, the thing with soy is that, again, it has a, the, the conception of being very, very healthy. Tofu, for example, being one of them. The thing with a lot of those things, or oh, soy milk, all these, all these kind of offshoots of soy, I should say, uh, have this, uh, the model of being a healthy type of food. The only three foods that I have known to really give people health benefits from soy are edamame, which you can see in the picture, miso, and natto. Those are the only three things. Everything else is actually more processed and heated and such that the nutrients, again, from the soy just get eradicated. I mean, they just get heated right out. So, I'll oh, go ahead. How about uh, temp what's it called tempeh or something? Tempeh, yeah, it's the same thing. Same thing as, uh, uh, what is it? As tofu, yeah. Same kind of processing and that kind of thing. So edamame, I mean, that's, that's soy in its natural form. So edamame is real, real good. Miso is fermented and natto is fermented as well. So there's a lot of benefits to fermented foods and natto itself is just the bean, again, fermented. So it doesn't have the shell. And miso is the bean fermented and just made into a paste. So I want to go into fermented foods. So you see just a list of fermented foods here. 
all the way from kimchi on the bottom right to sauerkraut to yogurt to natto itself. So the thing with those and why fermented foods are so, so beneficial is that <clears throat> to digest food, to assimilate nutrients, we need to have a lot of healthy bacteria within our intestines, our linings, those kind of things. Otherwise, I mean, if you're not digesting these foods, these nutrients, and if, I mean, if you've been taking a lot of antibiotics, you don't have a lot of this healthy bacteria to break down your food, and that can lead to inflammation, it can lead to sickness, those kind of things. So it does get pretty, it, it does get pretty serious. Uh, the benefits of this is that it has a lo I mean, a whole loads of healthy bacteria that your body takes and it loves. So again, it just helps break down the nutrients, break down the, the vegetables, the fruits that you're eating. And the funny thing is that natto itself is either hated or loved <laughs> by people. So some people just, I mean, it's just funny every time I ask. And it's got a very strong flavor to it. So... <laughs> My suggestion is just tell yourself how healthy it is and how good it is, and then just kind of just pinch your nose and just shove it down. So I'm one of those people that is kind of transitioning. I'm transitioning because I want to love it. I'm not there yet. And so a couple other things, kimchi. Kimchi is, other, is also fermented. And again, it's got a, a, all these fermented foods typically have a pungent smell to it. So kimchi, again, very, very beneficial. It's just, I mean, it's, Kimchi can be cabbage, it can be cucumber, it can be tons of things. And then sauerkraut, cabbage. So, and you know, I'm still working on my sauerkraut as well. <laughs> and then yogurt typically is, is the easiest one for most people to enjoy. And so most yogurts are fermented. And again, uh, just an example up there is a Greek yogurt. So, go ahead. What about, is it wine also? What's that? Wine. Wine? I believe so. So that, I, yeah, I have to be careful how I answer this one. No, yeah, just stick, I mean, everyone knows that one glass of wine is, is pretty good in terms of providing resveratrol. I'm not sure about the fermentation, though. I don't think it would benefit that way. It has other, other compounds. That doesn't mean you have to start drinking wine to, you know, to be healthy. Uh, on the contrary, if you're not drinking it, don't even, don't even bother with it. If you already are, then that's okay. The red wine is, is good. Okay, Molly? Yes, and I'll get to that in a second. No, no worries. I appreciate it. We'll get to that, though. So just keep that question in mind. And then if I, if I don't answer specifically, then just raise your hand when we're at that, at that section. So fermented foods, again, get a serving a day. And if you're not getting a serving a day, make sure you're taking some kind of probiotic. And again, this is just for your intestines and things. And that's crucial if you're on antibiotics because antibiotics just wipe out all bacteria. So we want to get some healthy bacteria back into the body. So here we go. We're going to move right on to the dairy section. I'm going to say leave the fat. So with the dairy, typically, I mean, you have a couple of examples right here. And typically you'll see fat-free, low-fat, 2%, 4%, all that kind of stuff. So my suggestion is, I'm just going to come right out and say it, leave the fat in. Stay away from the non-fat, the low-fat versions. That's a general rule of thumb. So I'm going to explain why. So we have this lucerne, fat-free, uh, cottage cheese, and you can see some of the ingredients. Uh, the fat-free milk, the pasteurized fat-free milk here, cultured milk, salt, whey, grade A whey, artificial color guar gum, all that Carrageenan, locust, mono, diglycerides. I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I don't even know. You know, I've heard of it. I just don't know what it looks like. Uh, does anyone know what a uh, carrageenan is? <laughs> All right. So, to me, if I'm putting that in my body, that's kind of suspicious. For something that's fat-free, I don't know how beneficial that is. My body probably doesn't even know what that is. And so that's a little scary. Then I look at this cottage cheese, four percent, and that's what the ingredients say. I recognize that. I know what that is. And believe me, your body will know what that is. Because uh, that's, just, just, that's just natural foods. Very, very simple. Right to the point. This is the thing that scares most people, though, is that you have five grams of fat in this one. Where's the other one? Oh, you don't see it, except being fat-free, it's going to have zero grams of fat. So my suggestion is leave the fat because 
generally, saturated fat has this bad rep. Bad rap. Uh, you know, there was a fat phobia that, that started, I'd say, 15 years ago. And that's where you start, started to see the onslaught of fat-free, low-fat. I mean, everyone just kind of marketing on that trend. And it was a little, well, I was just, I'll say it's, it was very misguided. It was very misguided. And since, you know, that started 15, 20 years ago, uh, the condition in this country, has, the health has just gotten worse. And that's because people started going more towards carbs, uh, enriched products, uh, wheats, all that kind of stuff, corn. Uh, my suggestion is saturated fat isn't what most people think it is. It's just a regular fat. It's got a bad rep because most people have way too much of it and not enough of the other, three, or the other two fats. So there's three types of fats. There's saturated, there's polyunsaturated, and there's monounsaturated. And so <clears throat> what I want you to do and what I want you to think about is thinking about get a balance of all three types of fats. One-third poly, one-third mono, and one-third regular saturated. That's the, benef that's, I mean, that's the most beneficial way to go. Because saturated fat, it's, it's naturally occurring in nature. You're going to find it in animal products, uh, such as dairy, and then just meats. So that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing at all. Like I said, I'd rather eat those three ingredients than the other 15. And that goes on to cheeses as well. And that goes on to, I mean, cream cheese, yogurts sour cream, all those kind of things. And I, I, say, I say that's a general rule of thumb simply because I've actually compared different brands that are full fat versions. And some brands will just throw in some other junk and I'm not sure why. Maybe they want texture or consistency that they're looking for. So as a general rule of thumb, I've seen it that the, fat, that the full fat versions have the least amount of ingredients. Uh, and just to explain that a little bit further, when you take something that's naturally occurring in nature and you take it out of it, you know, you're not going to get the same texture, the same taste. So that's what all the other stuff gets thrown in for. It's to make up for that, the natural occurring thing that you took out of it. So my suggestion is if you do drink skim milk, low-fat milk, switch to full fat. Know full well that you're going to get more calories, you're going to get more fat. So that means don't have three glasses. <laughs> you know, have one glass. So cut that down. Uh, just go ahead. You know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I think it may be just simply because that's, it may be organic feed that the cows eat versus okay. non-organic. I don't think, there's not too, too much of a benefit. I'm going to explain milk in a second. So, oh, go ahead. So you're reading all these labels and then you're like lactose intolerant. So what are you looking for in a label? So actually, I was going to get right into that. Because we're going to talk about milk specifically now. And again, you, you all see those, those got milk commercials and everything. Uh, with the athletes endorsing it and you know, you know, it's well known to give you strong bones and those kind of things. What you want to do is, I'll say this, 70% of the world's population is, is intolerant to lactose at varying degrees. So for most people I recommend just stay away from milk in general. And milk is very... <laughs> So there's a misconception to think that pasteurized is healthy for us. You know, to, to be 100% honest, raw milk is the best way to go. Simply because it has a lot of raw enzymes and bacteria, again, that's very, very beneficial to us and to our bodies. Uh, except what ended up happening was that these cows end up being kept in concentration camps, what they call CAFOs. Uh, and then the cows end up getting sick. They were fed antibiotics. They were fed uh, unnatural diet, corn, instead of the regular grass. And so the quality of the milk was very, very poor. And so, of course, they pasteurized it so that we could drink it. The best way to go is to get raw milk from grass-fed cows. Because that, I mean, that is a superior source of nutrition. Except you're not going to find it anywhere here. So what would you do? You, I wouldn't suggest getting any regular milk because of lactose intolerance and because of the quality of the product. I would suggest uh, these two things right here. Almond milk or coconut milk. So these are becoming very, very prevalent in, in grocery stores now. And again, that's if, you, if that's if you enjoy oatmeal and you want to throw in some kind of milk in the morning. Or if you just want to make a protein shake with something a little creamier, almond milk or coconut milk are phenomenal sources of just that milk substitute. First of all, you're going to get some healthy fats from the milk or from the almond or the coconut. And they taste very, very good. They taste very, very good. Just watch out for some varieties because some varieties do add a lot of sugar to it. 
like there's chocolate almond milk chocolate coconut milk and that's typically going to have <laughs> more sugar added to that so those are the two I would recommend you can find that at any store you can find it at Costco too I, I know you can find the, the almond milk at Costco and at Sam's Club so you can save bulk bulk purchases there and like I said there's no intolerance to those kind of things there's there's no lactose so you should be all set there and then I want to go right since we're talking about dairy we're gonna go right to ice cream so everyone's one of the favorite parts about the grocery store tour is the ice cream so typically we would go through the grocery uh, or go through the ice cream aisle pick out tons of things and I just grabbed you know three vanilla ones three vanilla ones except you'll see the starking difference between the three first of all the this one that you see here skim milk cream sugar egg yolks vanilla pretty simple five ingredients that's the ice cream I would recommend simply because those are all recognizable and that's actually Haagen-Dazs 5 so the cool thing about Haagen-Dazs 5 is each, each variety only has five ingredients and that's the way it should be made so you'll see it right on the front and then of course you'll see it right on the back the second one is the Lucerne and this is just a regular vanilla ice cream and then you see the milk the cream the sugar the corn and they throw corn syrup in there they throw non-fat milk in there, whey, natural and artificial vanilla, mono and diglycerized guar gum, locust gum, polysorbate 80. I love polysorbate 80. It gives it, no, I'm just kidding. Don't, stay away from this kind of stuff because again, what is it? It's unrecognizable. I'm sure you would never recognize it or actually see it in nature. Oh, polysorbate tree. <laughs> it's not like that. So stay away from it. Stay with the natural stuff. And on top of that, you know, a good rule of thumb when you're going through the grocery store tour is this. Would my great-grandparents know what this is? Would they recognize this as food? Is this food or is this just a food product, a food stuff? You know, an imitation of food. So think about that as you go through. Because I'm sure, you know, your great-grandparents would have a heart attack if they saw a lot of the stuff that we had in our grocery store tours or our grocery stores. And so, and actually, I'm not going to go through Briars. It's actually very similar to the Hagen Dazs 5, meaning that it has five ingredients. Very simple, basic. Uh, so, the Briars and the Hagen Dazs 5, those two I would recommend if you're looking for ice cream. Again, always check the label in the back because some of the Briars, like, they have some crazy flavors like uh, Oreo Cookie Crunch and stuff, and that's obviously not limited to five ingredients. That's a lot more with the Oreo cookies and stuff. Uh, and actually, one of the best solutions, and this is what I started to get into, uh, is making your own ice cream. So I finally bought an ice cream maker uh, for Christmas and basically just been experimenting with making ice cream because, let's face it, ice cream is fantastic. It's delicious. So what I've done actually with the ice cream is that, you know, I put in the cream, I leave out the sugar, I put in almond milk or coconut milk, and then I put in a flavoring, which is protein powder protein powder that's naturally sweetened and it tastes fantastic those three ingredients and it's, it's good to go so I've made chocolate coffee and so on so that's I mean you can have a lot of fun with that you could put in walnuts almonds you can make it healthy so I'm enjoying a nice bowl of protein rich ice cream every night so we're gonna go further on and go into the meat and the fish section and this one's a, a heavily loaded section as well so I'll oh, go ahead how much is an ice cream maker? You can find one on Amazon anywhere from like fifty to hundred dollars. And the cool thing is that Amazon has free shipping too. So that's one of the benefits to living out here. Or that's not one of the benefits to living out here. Just, uh, your ice cream recipe. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. That's a good suggestion. I like that. So going on and moving on to the, the meat section, you have I mean the fishes and the meats and all sorts of things. So you also have this in your in your front sheet packet in terms of what to stay away from what to go for and again what I'm going for is optimal it may not be in the budget all the time except just to let you know when you buy fish get wild caught get the wild caught fish except because that's you know right in the oceans it's wild caught it's not farm raised there's a huge difference between the wild caught fish and the farm raised fish farm raised meaning that they're just fed uh, a corn grain based diet not, not their natural part of the diet. And again, it's, it's like a concentration camp except for fish. They're just in this little tiny pond and so on and so on. 
get the wild caught except because that's where you know that's where they breed or that's where they're they're strongest and that's where they get all the nutrients the interesting thing about this the salmon here is that you can see it says farm raised product of canada also you can see and this makes it farm raised to another indication color added so most of the salmon that's farm raised is typically white they have to add that pink color because again the their natural diet their natural diet is krill and krill has this this compound uh, fantastic antioxidant as taxanthin that you can get in, in krill oil and such things that's fantastic for our bodies it's also great for salmon too and it gives us that nice pink color it gives shrimp that pink color as well except since they're not in nature and they're farm raised they they lose out on the specific antioxidant and they're white instead of that pink that we know of so color added you'll often find in farm raised product the other thing with this is this fish again is nutritionally far inferior it doesn't have all those omega-3s and benefits that we hear that salmon has if it's farm raised and unfortunately again it's, it's just cheaper and it's very widely available so you'll see it at a lot of restaurants and and again at most grocery stores or at most grocery stores uh, and actually, there was this one time where I was at Sam's and they had, uh, like, I think it was f for one month, they had a, a huge shipment, because it was in season, for just wild-caught salmon, Alaskan salmon. And the stark difference between just that color and the quality, just looking at it, was unbelievable. You'd see this, and you'd see, like, a pale pink, and then you'd see that, the wild-caught, and it's like a bright red. And, it, I mean, it's awesome. So wild-caught fish is the way to go. Uh, I mean, they both still have proteins in it. So, like I said if it may not be in the budget still want you to get some kind of protein in there you know farm raised would be okay on, on occasion except if you're going for optimal and the best wild caught is absolutely the way to go uh, on top of that you know we have the meats and there is the the poor selection the better selection and with the meats you'll see grain fed and grass fed the often thing is that you won't you won't see grain fed onto the on the product they will just say meat you know the grass fed will have grass-fed meat. So you'll know if it comes from a uh, grass-fed farm. And I talked a little bit about this before in terms of the milk. Grass-fed is the way to go simply because it's, it's a natural part of the cow's diet. You know, it's, it's, it's getting tons of nutrients, natural nutrients and everything from, from the grass. Uh, from the grains, not so much. They get sick. That's when they're fed a ton of uh, antibiotics and, so, and such things. I mean, it just gets stuck in their stomach. It's disgusting. Has anyone seen food ink before? Okay, so a couple people. So there's a segment in Food Inc. where there's a, I guess he's a doctor, a cow doctor. He's actually going, he's sticking his hand into one of the stomachs of the cow and just pulling out. Oh, all right. You can do it in Denmark. Really? Yeah. For fun or I mean? Is that like? Oh, cool. Very interesting. Does it hurt the cow? Not at all. That, see, that's so weird. Yeah. That's what he said in the, in the video, too. It doesn't hurt the cow when he's yeah, sticking his know. hand in the stomach. <laughs> so, I mean, he was just pulling out tons of junk. Cause, I mean, the cow's just eating corn and stuff, and it's not digesting. That's how they get sick. So, if you're getting just regular grain fed beef, it's, again, it's going to be an inferior type of meat. The cool thing about grass fed meat is that it's on par with wild caught salmon. It has just as much omega-3s and another uh, fatty acid called CLA that's more fat burning, CLA, than, I mean, than the grain fed or the, or the farm raised fish. I mean, these, these foods, again, are nutritional powerhouses if it's grass fed or wild caught. Again, just humans have a way of just tampering with things that, they, that we shouldn't be tampering with. So the last thing I want to talk about is the free range chickens. And again, with the chickens, you want to find something that's free range again because it's li that typically means it's lived. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, chickens should be allowed to roam and just do what they do. I mean, just be chickens. Unfortunately, there's a lot of places such as Tyson and those big companies are known for this. They just keep them in little CAFO units, uh, just concentration camps again. For, and they, don't, they really don't even see sunlight. They can barely move. A lot of them just get plumped up so much that they can even, they, they, they take a few steps and they have to just, you know, sit down because their legs don't support their body weight. So they don't move. I mean, they're just heavily fattened. They're fed corn. <laughs> it's just, it's a mess. And so with all those things, you know, it's just, it's not to be down. 
it's just I want you to make an informed decision over the foods that you get because the, typically the, the more expensive is, you know, is worth it in terms of what you're going to get for. So, I mean, to be 100% honest too, I don't always have free-range chicken, wild-caught fish, and grass-fed meat, except I do make that decision when I have the, the funds available for it. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to for everybody is if you have the funds available for it. So you make an informed decision, and if you can do it, absolutely go for it. I mean, it's, it's well worth it. So going on, peanuts, you know, peanut butter. So this is a section, this is what we see, and then of course we see other things such as reduced fat peanut butter, fat free, uh, not even fat free, just reduced fat and those kind of things, low fat peanut butter. And I've, I've run into a lot of people that, that choose the low fat, the, fat, the reduced fat, because they think, again, it's healthier. So I checked out the GIF, and this is the GIF reduced fat one right over here, actually. I look at the back and I see peanuts, corn syrup, solids, oh, yum. Soy protein, sugar, contains less than 2% of the following, fully hydrogenated vegetable oils, rapeseed, which is canola, cottonseed, and soybean. I mean, it's just a whole host of just <laughs> junk. So not necessarily the best thing I would say. All for saving, you know, a couple grams of fat up here. I don't think that that's best. So here's a regular, uh, a regular fat version of GIF. And again, you have the roasted peanuts, the sugar, the 2% or less of the molasses, fully hydrogenated vegetable oils, mono and diglycerides, and salt. And so the full fat, again, 16 grams. The other one was about 10. So those two things to think about. So again, what I just showed you, that would be the worst. The regular GIF would be somewhere in the middle. Let me show you what's best. We have a Smuckers. Look at those ingredients right there. Peanuts. <laughs> peanut butter should be peanuts. That's it. That's it. Peanut butter should not have soybean oil, molasses, high fructose corn syrup, all this other junk. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is what your peanut butter should be made of right here. Again, you recognize that. It's, it's comes from nature. That's, that's about it. And again, you just have to be well aware that it's 16 grams per serving, so make sure you're not having uh, you know, half a jar when you're watching a movie. Just kind of regulate that. You know, the real peanut, yeah, it's, it's, un it's unfortunate that you know, the healthier foods typically are a little bit more expensive, except you just have to know where to go. So, you know, with Aaron's suggestion, I'm gonna start to compile a list of where I go, because you know, that's, Sad to say, that's one of my hobbies, like grocery shop. <laughs> I like to look at different places and see different foods and see different prices and know where different things are. So general recommendations, just, uh, just uh, so we conclude this, this session. Don't eat food your great-grandparents wouldn't recognize. Uh, the second thing is make sure it's five ingredients or less. Five ingredients or less is a great rule of thumb when you're shopping for food. Very, very simple. I mean, third thing is if it swam, ran, or flew, or grew from the ground, it's good to go, all right? It, that means it came from nature, so your body would typically recognize it. And focus on the whole natural foods, and, it, and that just goes again with what your great-grandparents would recognize. Shop on the perimeter of the store typically is where you're gonna find all those whole natural foods on the perimeter of the store. I mean, you'll have the produce and the meat and then the dairy, maybe the alcohol, stay away from that. <laughs> and then never shop hungry. I mean, you shop hungry, then a lot of things are going to look tempting. Those chips on sale for $2, oh, that's great right now. I can eat those on the car on the way home. So don't shop hungry because you're, you're going to be thinking those kind of things. And then my last recommendation is stay away from cartoon characters. <laughs> stay away from any kind of cartoon character because you know that they're there for a reason. They want to pull you in, you know. You see a little leprechaun, you're like, oh, awesome. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff, uh, in, in all seriousness, that, that pull the children into the, like, that pull the children into wanting that product is because it looks good. It's not brownie crunch. I want that for breakfast, you know? I mean, who wouldn't? So, I mean, most kid cereals you'll actually find, like, on the bottom, a very strategic place. So when kids are walking along, they can see it. And, of course, you know, they'll uh, beg their parent for it. <laughs> And then I want to give you an idea of another popular breakfast treat. And th actually, this is uh, a treat that I grew up with. Because like I said, I, I got started with my transformation in college. So in high school, middle school, I used to eat all this kind of stuff for breakfast. I mean, Pop-Tarts. And I just looking at the back of a Pop-Tart, I mean, look at this list. It's unreal what's in that thing. 
it's unreal. Caramel color, soybean oil, corn cereal, gelatin, baking soda, sodium, pyrophosphate, monocalcium. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It looks like a chemistry textbook. It doesn't look like, you know, it's far from five ingredients. There's a lot more than that in there. So if you do have kids, make sure that you, I mean, it can be tricky because I know kids can be stubborn and very, very picky, except, you know, just kind of regulate certain things and, you know, make sure you draw the boundaries or draw the line at certain things because uh, that stuff is, is scary. And then, you know, regarding that, uh, that's the grocery store tour and hope you all enjoyed it. Do you have any last questions? I mean, we have a couple, a couple extra minutes, so any last questions that I didn't cover or anything that you want to get more clarity on? So yeah, soy milk is just, uh, any other soy product other than the three I listed is just very processed. So for milks, just stick with the almond or the coconut. And, <clears throat> and I mean, the soy milk again, that would be, <laughs> I don't know. I, I would just stay away from it. Yeah. Coffee and chocolate. So coffee, I mean, there's not... Coffee in general is, I mean, it's, it's natural. So there's nothing wrong with coffee. The only thing is that if you just overindulge, meaning like if you have two pots instead of two cups, then that might be a problem. Because that, what that does is that just kind of desensitizes your nervous system uh, throughout. Because, I mean, there's a lot of, that's a lot of, uh, what's the word? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a lot of caffeine. And caffeine is definitely, definitely a, a neuro, uh, a, a neurosimilar. Thank you. And so you don't, want to, you don't want to fry those receptors or anything like that, and that's what can happen. And so just watch out for that. So, I mean, one thing to do with the coffee, now that we're on that topic real quick, is that if you're looking to, to cut back on some of those calories, so say instead of putting in sugar and half and half, or absolutely stay away from those powder creamers. I mean, stay away from those. And if you ever look at the ingredients list, you'll know why. Uh, so what my suggestion is with coffee, just put cinnamon in it. Cinnamon and a little drop of vanilla extract, and it tastes fantastic. You know, of course, you're going to have to get, uh, it's not going to be the exact same as what you may be used to, except that's what I would suggest. Have you heard of the agave organic? Agave is okay, yeah. So agave, uh, I'm not a terrible, I'm, I'm not a big fan of in terms of using it as a sweetener, just because it's, it's a little bit more fructose than I'd like. So on one of the pages in your packet, there's a fructose chart. And this fructose chart is, it's pretty important if you're really looking for fat loss because a high amount of fructose throughout the day will definitely inhibit uh, your fat loss efforts. And typically the rule of thumb is Dr. Mercola recommends under 25 grams per day. So agave syrup has, I think, 70% of it is fructose. So I would just limit that. So you can kind of see some of the fruits in there and kind of modify and just kind of tailor it down if you're having a lot of the other fruits. Stevia is a great sweetener. Stevia is what I was going to get into. There's a lot of artificial sweeteners out there. Uh, I mean, such as sucralose, equal, aspartame, all those kind of things. And, you know, we're just coming to the find out that they have a lot of negligible or uh, negative effects, very negative effects, especially long term in terms of how it's absorbed in the body. So the only kind of natural, the only kind of sweetener that really stands out is stevia. It comes from just a regular stevia leaf. And so if you can find, I mean, you can get Stevie in the raw, actually at yeah, Safeway, you could get a big bag that I've seen. Uh, another note for my list. And then, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's actually really good, the Stevie. So that's what I would suggest. And then just make sure you find it in, in other products that are artificially sweetened with Stevia. Okay. Frozen yogurt. I'm going to let you go to the grocery store and find out. Most frozen yogurts, again, it has a whole host of other things. Oh, I would say not most. I'd say half and half from what I've seen. So you just have to have a specific brand that you like and then just check that out and see if on the back those are ingredients you recognize. I uh, see. Yeah, I don't know. You could, you could ask for an ingredients list. Or you could go online. Typically, I found a lot of ingredients lists for like Jamba Juice and those places online. Okay, just two more questions, Sandy. Yep. 
I would say yes, just because you want, I mean, it's a great source of healthy fat. So you definitely want to have some kind of, some kind of fat in there, um, just to kind of round up the meal. And of course, that's going to keep you more satiated as well. Avocado. avocado is a great suggestion, yes. And then one, one last question. All right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the least tampered with. Right. Definitely. So cloudy is the word. Cloudy. The so cloudier the better. Yeah, and again, just one more note on that, on that cloudy aspect. Same goes with honey. Honey is another good sweetener. Of course, you want to limit it, except make sure you get the honey that's not translucent. You want to get the dark, dark, cloudy honey, because again, that's another thing that can be highly, highly heated and to get that clear appearance. And honey can be beneficial in terms of having some, again, raw enzymes and nutrients within the raw honey itself. So get honey that's very, very dark. All right, if you have any last questions, again, you know, you can see me at any point, uh, you know, during one of the breaks or anything. We're going to go on a 10-minute break right now just to get set up, and then we're going to have one half of y'all split to the food section and the other half split over here to the foam rolling section. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know. We're going to go on